Well, hello everyone. We are recording live from Studios B3 and I'm Spencer Brinkerhoff III. Welcome to our very first Star Wars Rebels video roundtable. Um, if I'm kind of looking all over the place because I'm trying to get it all figured out, it's a grand experiment. We'll get the background taken later, but for now, we're just happy to be here. So today we're talking about Season 3, Episodes 11 and 12, a special two-part mid-season premiere titled Ghosts of Geonosis. Now these episodes originally premiered on January the 7th, 2017, and they were written by Stephen Melching and Matt Michnovets. Now let's welcome our guests and then get right into our discussion of the Ghosts of Geonosis. So our first guest up, if I can get this button done right, we're at welcome Marcus. Oh, Marcus, tell me your la how you say your last name. Doring? Doring. Mm -hmm. Doring. Marcus, welcome to the show today. How are you? Good. I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you for the invitation. Hey, Marcus, um, I've got a, a screen up right now, and uh, I can see that you're with the 501st cast. Uh, will you tell us a little bit about what you do there and how you got into Star Wars? Okay, so I'm a, a co-host of the 501st cast. Uh, we are two other hosts. Um, I've been doing this just for probably under a year. We try and record every four, five, six weeks just to give a rundown of uh, past events, upcoming events uh, of, of that sort, I mean, membership numbers, uh, approved costumes, right. all that stuff. Awesome. Um, how I got into Star Wars. Yeah, um, yeah. So you say approved costumes. And obviously, you're with a 501st cast, so you know you have armor. You know, and How did you start into Star Wars? Where did that start for you? Oh, when I was a child. Yeah. Um, I was born in 73. Uh, I didn't watch the... Uh, I didn't watch A New Hope um, until much later, but I think my first movie, if I remember correctly, was was Empire, and then, then Jedi, then A New Hope. So completely out of order. Um... But back then, it kind of went over my head. I didn't. You know, it doesn't. It didn't matter if I knew uh, if that Vader was uh, Luke's uh, father. And, right. And, it, it went all over. But, <laughs> uh, and it kind of it, it kind of stayed with me. I um, even through the so-called dark ages, I was always trying to stay up to date with West End Games books. And uh, awesome. Of, so I'm happy when we finally got a new novel in 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 uh, ninety one with uh, Timoth Timothy Zahn. That's right. That's right. That's so awesome. And and Zahn is back. Thrawn is back. We have lots of lots of exciting things that are that are coming back to us from those dark ages because we have uh, because we have the uh, the the Star Wars Rebels. So uh, our next guest tonight, John, I met you through Facebook and uh, I I don't think we've clarified this, but your name is John Icewater. Is this really your name, John? <laughs> no, it's not really my name. It's not really my name. Um, now, wait a second. Name... Now, you don't have to tell us your real name if there's some secrecy issues, you know, <laughs> or some uh, something that you're trying to keep under wraps. But, John, welcome to the show, John Icewater. You're coming to us from the Blockade Runner podcast. So, John, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, the Blockade Runner podcast, that's a show that uh, myself and a few friends have been doing for about the last year and a half or so. Um, and in terms of my Star Wars fandom, um, I was born in 82, so um, Star Wars was is, is older than I am. And uh, I was really young when that first wave of Star Wars movies was uh, was leaving theaters. So for me, it was, you know, mid-90s when I was, uh, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old. I really started to get into it. Uh, I enjoyed Star Wars a lot as a kid before that, too. And I have an older brother who was really into it when it when it was first hitting the scene. But um, for me, it was like the mid-90s when it started to come back, you know, Shadows of the Empire era, things like that. Um, and then... Uh, some friends and I who were all, you know, subscribing to Star Wars Insider, um, we caught word of Star Wars Celebration happening in Denver, Colorado. Oh, I was nice. Seven, yeah, I was, seven, I was 17 years old in high school, high school junior, um, really geared up for the Phantom Menace, of course. And uh, we somehow convinced our families to, uh, you know, allow us to go out to Denver for three days. And uh, we drove <laughs> there from, from Illinois, from near Chicago. And, uh, you know, since then, it's just been full steam ahead. You know, huge Star Wars fan. And those are the best you know, best couple of days um, that I'd had at that point. It was it was brilliant, and you know, lifelong Star Wars fan after that. So awesome! And uh, hey, Marcus, what was your first celebration? Uh, celebration two. Celebration yeah. two. Yeah, I, I was I was born in Germany. I'm from Germany originally, and um, I flew to Indianapolis 
in in O two, just just to attend. Wow. And then, um, yeah, it's back when John, you mentioned uh, Celebration One, I had the choice to make. Okay, do I want to watch uh, the Phantom Menace in in May or do I want to go to a Celebration in April? Because in Germany, it wouldn't. Uh, Phantom Menace wasn't on until September, I think, and there was no way I would have waited. I could I could wait that long. So I flew to New York for just a day from from Berlin, Germany, to watch the Phantom Menace. And um, but yeah, I would have I would have liked oh, to wow. be in, in Denver and uh, watch the Menace uh, Phantom Menace, um, you know, in, in in May. But it didn't work out. So but yeah, celebration two of awesome. the first one. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> All right. So let's kind of jump into the episode a little bit. I want to, I want to hit a small recap before we, uh, we go in full blast. So this episode, it kind of starts all the way back in season two, episode 15. So the ghost crew um, had gone to Geonosis to learn more about what the Empire had been building. Now, those events, you know, that take place there, that was the episode titled The Honorable Ones. I think that that takes place roughly like three years before Rogue One. Because we have Forrest Whitaker, you know, back uh, as a voice in this in this special two-part episode, um, and, and he was uh, Saw Guerrera in, uh, in Rogue One, you know, I think it's important to mention that that takes place about that time. So the ghost has reported that their findings back to the headquarters, and after some deliberation, they decided that they were going to send the legendary Saw Gerrera and his rebel crew in to find out what the Empire, why the Empire had wiped out an entire popula population, and what they were trying to hide by wiping out that population. So they themselves, you know, saw on his team, they went missing on Geonosis, and then Hera and the ghost crew, they've been called in to find out what has really happened. So when the crew gets there, they discover a sole surviving Geonosian uh, who may be able to tell them what the secret that the Empire is trying to keep. And um, they were then they were discovered by the Empire themselves, and they've got to fight their ways out. So in this one, First and foremost, we have Saw Gerrera, and I feel like there's been a lot of a uh, lot of attention made about him being into the show and being back in the show. So, John, uh, uh, first impressions with uh, with Saw coming back into the show. What did you think about that? Were you excited about that, or or what happened? Oh yeah, yeah, I was absolutely excited about Saw Gerrera coming back. Um, you know, I think we were all really excited when we heard he was going to be part of Rogue One in the first place, especially if you're a fan of Clone Wars. And so to hear then that uh, you know he was he was going to go from Clone Wars to uh, Rogue One and then back to Rebels was really cool. Uh, my impression of Saw as a character in the episode uh, definitely is a little bit different than 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 how he appears in Rogue One. Um, I think they were really trying to find uh, the balance between you know Saw you know being very extreme but then also sort of you know understanding his motivations and and where his morality is and things like that so uh, i certainly enjoyed him in 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 this episode or these episodes um i feel like he's he's not quite the same character we see in rogue one but there's enough time in between that you know i think that makes sense right and uh i i almost felt like his I knew it was Forrest Whitaker because they said it was Forrest Whitaker, but I didn't really feel like it was the same Saw Gerrera, and so his voice didn't quite seem to match. You know, Marcus, what was your take on on uh, Saw showing up and Forrest being the voice in, in this uh, first episode? I mean, overall, it was a nice, um, a nice gesture to have him back, especially since we just all watched Rogue One and we right. just saw him. So that was that was good storytelling, good good TV making um, to have him back like that. And and as we all know, he looked more like the saw that we saw in the trailers that didn't make right. it into the movie. And yeah. uh, that was also touched upon by Pablo in the um, Rebels Recon. Oh yeah, with the uh, with the with the shaved shaved head, you know, and they made sure that the, the flashback legs. scene matched back the, with the yeah. legs. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> But overall, um, yeah, he was he was um, you know a bit more in his prime than he was in Rogue One, um, because something extremely bad must have happened to him between you know the episode that we watched or the two episodes he watched and Rogue One. Right. Um, so he was a bit more you know extreme in his in his actions 
um, then then he wasn't Rogue One, uh, obviously. So that I think was uh, that that stood out as, as something that, that um, I it was very noticeable. Right, right. Him being more extreme. Now, yeah, I we mentioned a little bit that he had both legs in in the final sort of like battle in this episode when that thermal detonator landed right by his foot. Did anybody think he was going to get his foot blown <laughs> off? Yeah. Did you guys think yeah. that at all? <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought it was a possibility, absolutely. Yeah. Right, right. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, though, Spencer. You said you, you didn't feel like it was quite Forrest Whitaker or quite the same character. Um, you know, I thought the voice sounded a little bit different, and I think that's intentional as well. But for mm. me, it, it was the laugh. It was that kind of, like, I oh, dare right. say, like, sort of creepy laugh that he does. Right, um, Where right. I was like, well, this feels like, this feels like Saw from, from Rogue One, I think, a little bit there. So, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. creepy laugh did it? So, yeah, that, was, that so, was when I knew it was authentic. Right, <laughs> right. So then the we meet Saw, you know, but originally we're going here to um, get to the planet of Geonosis. Now, uh, we, we spoke a little bit about sort of like touching back on these elements that sort of tied into the greater Star Wars story, being back on Geonosis. Now, when they first sort of like when Bail Organa showed up and said that we're going to send you, we've, we've bent over your mission log and we're going to have you go back to Geonosis. I didn't remember that they had been to Geonosis. It was so brief. Did, did that take you guys back at all that, you know, you're like, oh, hey, when, when did that happen? Either of you guys? Marcus? Well, I remember, oh, sorry, John? I remember, the, I remember the visual. I remember the visual of the planet of Geonosis and the sort of the, the debris. I, I actually, now that I think about it, did they go down to the planet um, in that season two episode or was it just kind of they arrived in, you know, near it? Now, I didn't go back to watch it. Marcus, did you go back and watch it? I don't recall. Um, again, in Recon, it was, it was mentioned that um, they've been there before, but I do, not, I do remember if they've actually been on the, on the surface um, or not, but uh, the Death Star was already gone at that yeah. time. Right, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. So I think that what had happened is they, they showed up and um, they were investigating what was being built in that area. And when they got there, Callus was there and it was a, a surprise attack. And because he attacked them and they were trying to escape, Zeb ended up in an escape pod with Callus and went down to one of the Genosis moons. And so this episode was the beginning of um, Callus turning into the new, oh, spoilers, into the new fulcrum right because yeah. he had they had this connection with the rebels and then that was the beginning there so i thought another thing that was interesting about this one was um geonosis so fulcrum is a lever or a, a, a turning point and i was listening to the audiobook of dr no um a james bond novel the other day and uh and dr no says give me a fulcrum and i can change the world and, you know, he, I think he was quoting Archimedes, but what happens there is the fulcrum is that thing that the lever that helps you make these changes. And I got to thinking about that. And Geonosis is sort of like a fulcrum planet. So we've got the Death Star that happened there. We've got Callus uh, that, that has changed there. We've got the, uh, the queen, you know, of the Geonosis and the, and the survival of the Geonosis species that all happened there. So I, I thought that that was sort of an interesting take as well. I mean, we could we could add to that uh, Padme and Anakin sort of solidify their relationship there on Geonosis and Attack of the Clones. Right. And, uh, you know, Anakin loses his arm. I mean, there's there's quite a bit of uh, significant events that that happened there in, in Attack of the Clones as well. So absolutely a good point. Good call. Sure. Good call. And something else that's really fun to bring in from the other episodes is we have the return of Bail Organa. He's there just to sort of like give us a mission briefing, but then we jump right into it and we're able to like start the rest of the episode. Um, first impressions, you know, uh, landing on Geonosin, a uh, Geonosia. Ge Am I saying it right? I feel like I I've said it too many times. Now it feels weird to me. So when they land there, do you guys remember some of like the cutscenes from uh, A New Hope and there's the sandstorm? The, the level of, of animation oh. detail that we yeah. have now with these animated shows is so fantastic. We're getting this sandstorm sort of a scene, and it there it is. It's like we're in a movie, and they split yeah. up right away, and they go off on their separate missions. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, the first part of them, they, they head down into the caves and they're calling down. Let me look at my, uh, my notes real quick here. Uh, the team split up and they head out. Um, we've got Rex here who's been sort of like our thread that has carried us through all of these different uh, episodes. And, and Rex is the one who gives us uh, an explanation on Saw Gerrera, who he is, what his backstory is. And he talks to us a little bit about Geonosin. Geonosia. Can I, let's say it for me. Somebody, somebody else say it. <laughs> so, yeah, Geonosis. Yeah. Geonosis. Uh. There you go. So what happens then is, is Rex is this thread that helps us bring it back. Do you guys remember um, when Rex was on Geonosis? What, any, any recall on him being uh, there for the, um, for the first battle of Geonosis or was he just there in the Clone Wars afterwards? I do not recall. Hmm. I think it yeah, may, I'm embarrassed. You know, to, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know. I, I feel like if he's in Attack of the Clones, I should know he's there, but I'm I'm not positive. Yeah, but that's the thing is that I don't think that he actually showed up in Attack of the Clones. You know, uh, in the movie for sure, in the in the the film. But he, the first time that we have uh, Rex show up in the Clone Wars is on the Battle of Christophus. And so I don't know if he was there at Geonosis at all. So it felt weird that he was sort of like, yeah, I didn't ever think I'd be back here, but I believe that he, there was a second battle of Geonosis with, with Anakin and Kiati Mundi and, oh, oh my gosh, it's the, uh, the brain invaders. When um, Barris Ofe had the, um, the Geonosian worm that went up her nose, I think that okay. they were all in that one as well. Okay. So... That that was pretty awesome. I, I love that part. All right. So um, other impressions as we're talking about sort of like Geonosis, and we're talking about uh, the away team as they split up on their separate missions. And um, I, I I wanted to ask you guys your impression about uh, Zeb. Has it felt like Zeb has not really been an active part in the last couple of episodes of Rebels? And they're like, and and, and when they were giving him a mission, he was like, oh, I'm going to stay behind. So, oh, good. So I can finally kick some Imperials' butt if they showed up. John, do you feel like uh, Zeb's been left out of uh, of some of these episodes lately? I mean, there's been, there's been less of a focus on Zeb in season three, I think. Um, I don't feel like it's it hasn't felt unnatural or misplaced i wouldn't say right but yeah i can always go for a little more zeb you know so it was nice um i feel like we got a little more of him here um but yeah if we go back to season one i mean he's an integral part of most episodes right whereas season two and now season three um it does feel like we're getting more character centric episodes. Right. The team is split up more often. And, you know, that, I mean, unfortunately, Zeb is one of those characters that I think we're seeing less of um, sometimes anyway. Well, yeah. and, and Zeb had his story where some of the, uh, the ancient ones kind of came back and he got to find that there were some more Lasats, you know. And so he did get a little bit character building. I think that this season we're going to see uh, a lot more of Sabine as well. Um, so speaking of being on Geonosis and speaking of, uh, of, of getting down into here, into the battle with, um, with Rex, uh, Marcus, what did you think about those battle droids, uh, when they showed up? Did you know, did you notice the mismatching color parts to them at all? I did. I did. I thought at first it was, uh, you know, the shadow thing, but then when they were more visible, I, I, I saw, yeah, those are kind of botched together. Right. Um, by, I guess it was Click Clack. Um, yeah, I think it was him. I think it was him. Yeah. So, but but going back to Rex just for a second, I think he was really the only one who was able to handle uh, Saw. Not oh, much yeah. physically, but also like, you know, I'm like, hey, we have a history together. Listen to me. I know what's going on. And, you know, you don't know the Rebels crew yet, but um, so I figured, I, I thought they were kind of uh, in over there, their heads a little bit, the right. rest of the Rebel crew with Saw, because right. he is so extreme. Um, I, I think that's a great point, and I think also that, uh, you know, Saw is uniquely able to understand, uh, or no, I'm sorry, not Saw, um, Rex is uniquely able to understand and empathize with Saw in a way that most of those other characters maybe can't, um, because he went through a similar experience in the Clone Wars. I mean, maybe Kanan, um, but uh, I feel like, you know, 
um, Rex kind of feels like a brother in arms with uh, Saw, right. and like you know he's got that empathy because sometimes Saw is not very you know sympathetic, right? Um, but yep. Rex maybe has more of an insight into that and can kind of go to bat for him a little bit. Well, I I think Saw is uh, I. I we, we, it took a little bit in this episode for him to actually sort of like for his demeanor to, to come out. You know, it took a little bit for us to actually see the Saw Guerrero that was uh, the guy that we saw in the, in the, uh, the Rogue One. And there was a couple of those times where he was saying, you know, listen, you know, a lot of people in this rebellion don't want to recognize that we're at war. And in war, you know, people die and family die. And, and I'm being extreme because I have to be extreme. Everyone else is being extreme. So I think that this was a lot of the uh, a lot a lot of him sort of like changing and coming into sort of like we're, we're getting to see some of that transition. Um, one of the things that I thought was uh, sort of interesting is um, Eric Geller and I talked a little bit about sort of like Saw Gerrera and his history in the Clone Wars. And we went back and covered those those episodes as sort of like as a primer. And one of the key elements that they sort of like taught in that uh, those episodes was you, you take the thermal detonators and you roll them real gently underneath the destroyer droid's shields. And when you do that, you can blow them up. And so... As soon as the destroyers showed up with all the battle droids, and I was like, oh, here they are. Roll it out there. That's exactly what we do. And they didn't do it. They, they kept getting beat by the same old, same old destroyer droids. <laughs> it's like they hadn't learned anything at all. Yeah, and I was a little I was a little suspicious of the idea that if you just destroy the remote that controls them, then that kind of shuts them down. That one right. didn't. You know, well, if I break my remote to my TV, it, my TV doesn't turn off. I just can't control it anymore, you know? Right, right. But that's okay because we we needed it to save, you know, Sabine and, and uh, Zeb as well. Um, I think that one of the other things that I, I found interesting in this scene as we're leading up to it is that here we have um, our, our crew has come together. They have now met up with... Um, with Saw, they found out what's happened to his his crew. And it was almost like breadcrumbs. You can see those helmets. I thought that they were going to get hijacked, you know, like like Click Clack was setting a trap. But when they get there and they start to translate for um, for Click Clack, why do you guys think, um, Marcus, tell me, let's talk a little bit about Ezra and sort of like his progression. Um, Ezra it, it has been called upon to be the translator for Click Clack, this Geonosin. So why do you think that that Kanan is stopping and saying, "Well, Ezra, why don't you be why don't you be the the translator here?" You know what what what's I, going I, on with Ezra's growth? Well, Ezra obviously has been has been trained um, behind the scenes, so to say, without us seeing it. Right, uh, like in between episodes, because he got he got so strong all of a sudden that um, it the only way that can be explained is that that um Kanan has been in, inter, integral in his in his part in, in his training so i think he like like that kind of role to be the translator or the the intermediary between click clack and, and the group is probably another lesson for for him right right you know less, less of a physical training but more like a i don't know you know what, what the jedi's role was in the past to be sort of the inter you know the 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 middle ground between two parties right trying to negotiate something so i think that's just part of his training and and i think it's also important to sort of like realize it is part of that training is that you know i think that kanan is recognizing that uh, ezra may have a, a stronger connection than he does in certain situations mm -hmm. and so he as they were trying to diffuse everything and they knew that saw was getting really sort of like all over click clack Kanan says, "Let let's let Kanan let's let uh, Ezra have a, a, a try at this one." Um, John, did you have any other any impressions about that scene at all, or uh, or what's going on with Ezra? Did you see any growth with Ezra in this episode, or or anything like that? Well, I think um, I think that Ezra has always had a connection to sort of like creatures and aliens and oh, animals right, and right. that sort of thing. He's he seems to be really good with that. Um, there's a lot of empathy um, in him. He he, he can um, you know commiserate with uh, other creatures or other people that are in pain or are suffering some kind of loss, and that seems to be 
something for him. I mean, you know, he's lost his parents and he's lost so much in his life. I feel like where Saw is just angry at Click Clack, maybe um, Ezra's looking at this this creature and thinking, you know, look at uh, look at all this creature has gone through and, and let's be empathetic to that creature. In terms of growth for Ezra, I think it's interesting because this, you know, season two ended, season three began with a pretty strong, um, what would you say, inclination that Ezra was really kind of toying around too much with the dark right. side. And right. he was kind of going in that direction. And you start to wonder, you know, is he is he going to become more of a selfish character? Is he going to become more self, -mo you know, uh, motivated by his own self-interest and things like that? But then... You know, we, we're seeing now after the first few episodes of season three that he really, as far as I can tell, seems to be kind of back mostly to the old Ezra. Yeah. Um, very heroic, very kind hearted. And so certainly we saw that with Anakin, too. You know, he would have these moments of darkness, but then, you know, he was still at his core that good person. I'm curious to see what the second half of season three holds for Ezra. You know, right. which way are they right. going to go with him? And there was... Um, there was lots of fun, uh, lots of fun hints going on in that uh, in that trailer okay. for the rest of the season, yeah. right? Man, so uh, that's so that's Ezra. That's Ezra's growth. We I think that you also touched on something uh, else that was really important in there is that you talked about him being sympathetic to um, Click Clack and Click Clack as you know uh, as an alien. This is a first time, and I think that um, Marcus, you you brought up the uh, the Rebels Recon. Um, and I think it was mentioned there, but this is the first time that we've actually had a Geonosin and we've looked at them as a sympathetic character that we actually try and understand a little bit more about what they're going through. Um, did you think that, that, did you feel for click clack in this episode, Marcus? Did you think that he was like, you know, that we, did you want him to sort of like, um, win or, or survive or, or did, did, how did you feel that was going? I do. I mean, he was apparently, as far as we know, the last of his of his race, uh, excluding the egg, um, that survived the the you know what we later know or learn as the the poisonous um, attack. But uh, yeah, I felt for him. I mean, he right. must have been just you know imagining myself being the last one on Earth. How lonely that must be, and how frustrating, because he can't go anywhere. You know, he doesn't have a ship. Right. Um, he, um, you know, he he can only protect himself from 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 the outside with with his his battle droids um, that he put together out of out of parts. So I think he he was very yeah lonely and uh, obviously afraid right of, of what of what's to come. And um, I, I I had an interesting thought you know as you were talking here. Uh, there was a stop motion animation. I think it was done by uh, Tim Burton called James and the Giant Peach. And uh, there was a scene in there where the grasshopper character, um, uh, I think the grasshopper, one, one of the characters jumps off of the peach and goes down into the water. And, and the other character says, oh, no, he's committed pesticide. And so with all of the bugs being wiped out on Geonosis, I wondered if this would be considered pesticide. That's does that sound right? <laughs> yeah. I think so. I think so. I think so. So I want to especially with those uh, those big containers of uh, oh the raid the toxic gas yeah yeah <laughs> the raid right. Well, let's talk about those big containers for a second, John. Since you brought those up, um, click clack during this episode kept drawing the circle in the mm -hmm. sand, the two circles, mm -hmm. and they kept mm -hmm. being confused. Um, as as a as an audience, you know, we usually know more than the characters in the episode know. So, how do you think that that played out during the episode? Was it was it frustrating for you that you knew what was going on and they couldn't figure it out, or or tell me your impressions on on Click Clack's drawing in the sand and and our and our crew trying to figure it out? Yeah, I mean a little bit of frustration maybe, um, but also I think it was uh, it was maybe necessary to sh sort of show us that um, certain characters in the crew were not willing to or not able to kind of hear what they needed to hear or kind of I, I think for for instance saw he really was not able for most of the episode to to listen to click clack to be open to what he might get from click clack and so you know, the fact that he's, that they're missing this, this huge piece of information that he's trying to give them. It's frustrating for audiences, but it's also one of those things that's really illustrative of a problem within the characters. 
it's an, a flaw that they have, I think. Right, yep. right. I mean, they they saw they saw the the two circles, but if if you have no idea what that what that means, then it's right? really up to interpretation. And later on, we learned that Rex thought, okay, yeah, well, yeah, those canisters that that's what he was trying right. to tell us. But right. um, if, yeah, again, if you have no idea what that even remotely could resemble, then uh, there's no there's no way for them to figure it out. Of, of course, we were all screaming at the, at the screen. <laughs> and, but, well, you know. And that was something else is that, you know, that Dooku had been communicating with these guys, you know, in the whole like s series of the Clone Wars, you know, and so someone knows how to understand the Geonosians. So somewhere there's got to be an interpreter out there that we could have had the truth. We could have known what was happening. But you know what? They thought they figured it out. And so they didn't even pursue it anymore. Yeah. So I want to. I... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. Well, I just I, one thought that I had was um, is it was it not possible for Chopper to understand click clack? I mean, I guess he's not a protocol droid, right? So maybe if they had had a C three PO huh. type droid there, they would have been okay. But part of me was wondering, um, you know, sure. maybe Chopper could kind of pull his weight and see right. if he could understand. Right, what click way to go, was, Chop. Was saying, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, what I want to do now is uh, we've cut to we talked about the episode sort of in generalities. We've gone through it a little bit uh, back and forth. I want to talk about some of uh, favorite moments, you know, and and some of the things that sort of like hit you and kind of went, yes. Um, Marcus, do you want to start with a, a favorite moment from this episode? I well, I like that saw that we saw 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 um, saw. <laughs> yeah, in, in the episode, because again, it was just a flawless, uh, tr you know, transition from Rogue One into into Rebels, despite the, you know, the physical um, uh, discrepancies, so to say, between the right. saw that we saw in the movie and, and and today, but or yesterday, but um, I, I like that. It was it was well planned out, and I'm sure. Um, the, the story group uh, at Lucasfilm was was pulling all the strings to to get this done in time and yeah um, it was interesting again what what Pablo said about about the look of saw um, you know his his shaven head and and I wrote it down and I'm gonna just just read it real quick um, he said we based the look of saw on flashback saw uh, and flashback saw actually had more scenes back in the day where we would see Saw look more like what we saw him in the trailer with completely shaved head, and that's our version of Saw. So that's that's exactly what right. Pablo said. Um, the 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 flashback Saw that we never really got to see in the movie. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously animation takes a long time to complete, and I I have a feeling that that um that Saw that we saw in the trailers was initially obviously supposed to be in the movie. And he was animated based on that. Right. Like See, a, com a complete saw with, with legs and, and right, and, um, and so functioning and, and no breathing issues. Yeah, it's kind of it's, it's kind of like we got to experience um, some of those cut scenes because they exist in Star Wars Rebels. Um, I I read an interesting article lately that said that the the way that the ghost and Chopper and um, these other sort of like callbacks the way that those characters ended up in uh, Rogue One was simply sort of like two teams giving each other a high five. You know, ILM is over there working on, you know, their new movie. And I think it might have even been John Knoll. But he said, hey, listen, um, we're thinking it would be kind of cool if we put, you know, some of your ships in there. Do you guys have some models we can borrow? And they're like, yeah, that'd be awesome. Here's some models. And here's these hammerheads. You know, wait, Marcus, is that is that the right one? Because you mentioned the, uh, the West End Games, right? Uh, the... The name of the ships that Princess Leia stole and they showed up in Rebels, that then they were the ones that hit the uh, the Star Destroyer to go down into the gate on Rogue One. Those were hammerheads, right? They, that's what they were called. Yeah. Okay. So those hammerheads? Think, yeah. So they, they, so, yeah. they just handed over those models and then they added that in there. So it's just sort of like one team sort of like going to another team and going, hey, this would be cool. What do you think about that? So, so John, did you have uh, some some standout moments from the episode that you kind of went, "Oh, I really love that"? 
Well, I uh, I actually really appreciated the humor in the episode. I thought there was a couple great jokes. Um, Sabine kind of winked at the audience and made that reference to uh, sand. And, oh, and yeah. Just okay, sand. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I thought that was great. Um, and then I, I loved it, too, when... Um, when Kanan made that that jump across the platform oh, yeah. or across that chasm, you know, and Captain, uh, I mean, and Saw, Saw says, I forgot they could do that. And Rex says, yep. well, yeah, but he's no Skywalker. Oh, I know. And it, yeah. Kanan, <laughs> oh, I heard that. You know, I thought that was, I thought that was a, a nice light moment. I thought that was great. So, and you know, what's uh, funny for me is when, when, when he actually said, when Rex said, yeah, he's no Skywalker, my first thought was Luke. I, I oh, yeah. wasn't thinking of Anakin. My first thought uh-huh. was Luke, not not Anakin Skywalker. I was like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. But I I really I really enjoyed that throwback. And uh, continuing on with that scene is immediately thereafter down the tunnel. You can hear Kane and go, I heard that. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so right, right, right. it's like you can't get away from me. You know, I know it. Right. It was yeah. it was wonderful. Uh, one of the things that I, I liked a lot was when uh, Sabine like showed up, right? So the battle is going on. The rocket troopers or jump troopers, oh, yeah. they come flying in and um, Saw is kicking the, the, the thermal detonators away. The, the, our Jedi and Apprentice are, are knocking down all of the, the blaster bolts. And all of a sudden, Sabine comes out and they all kind of go, oh. She's got this. And they sat back and, and said that this is going to be fun, right? And they just watched her jump into action. I, I loved, loved, loved seeing Sabine in action. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I, when I was, uh, I, don't, I, can't, I can't remember how long ago this was, but when I saw Sabine jump into action, I was instantly thrown back to the Django Fett Bounty Hunter game. Either of you guys remember that game? Or you... oh, yeah. mm-hmm. oh man, yeah. I love that game so much that I recorded myself playing it on VHS tapes so that I could have all of the cinematics and have the gameplay so that I could have my own little bounty hunter movie. And when Sabine jumped in, I was like, it's Django Fett. He's, she's flying in there. And something that I didn't catch um, on the initial viewing is that there's a scene where she comes in and she lands and she sort of like crosses her, her guns a little bit. And as she leans forward, you can see that her repaired jack pack has also been painted. And there on either side, she's got two big wings on either side of her jet pack. And I was like, oh, Sabine, she's she's the best. She's the best. She- and I think that she's going to be the next one to get a, a big sort of like character story arc. You know, we're going to see some more Mando stuff coming up next. All right. So let's see. You guys, uh, other thoughts from the episode? I'm going to look at notes really quick and see if there are some other things that uh, that I thought about talking about. Um, John, you had something? Well, just, you know, I, I appreciate it and, and I liked the um... – some of the very sort of melodramatic or very intense dialogue, you know, saw said things like uh, war is loss, you know, and everyone loses family in war. Um, you know, both sides do. And, and, you know, um, I don't think it explores the cost of war maybe to the level that uh, something like Rogue One does, but right. it's still, I think that they're really kind of, um, they're working with some of these ideas in a way that's pretty sophisticated and pretty interesting. And so, um, you know, I thought there were some standout lines from from Saw Gerrera, and he was pretty heavy. I, I feel like it's fair to say pretty heavy handed, like painted in a, in a pretty heavy handed way. You know, he's very intense and, uh, right. you know, he held that he held that blaster up to that egg. Up to and the I mean, egg. He was, yeah. He was, getting, <laughs> he was getting pretty intense there. Right. Um, so, you know, I, yeah, the dialogue was maybe, like I said, maybe a little bit melodramatic or a little bit uh, on the nose. And in some points, it wasn't super naturalistic feeling. But but I thought there were some really good lines. And uh, I like to see them kind of exploring those, um, I don't know, the, the more com- the complexities of war, I guess you'd say. Right. I enjoy that as well. That was that was another standout uh, element of this episode. Um, something else that I that I really enjoyed about this one is that we also um, – got to have a little bit we got to see some new characters i think general dodana did he show up for a, a minute in this one or was mm-hmm. well we saw bail organa oh ba- bail okay organa and- that's right so we we saw bail organa for a minute and then uh we had the introduction of a new um lieutenant oh, let me check my notes oh imperial captain 
Brunson. So I super enjoyed that when that light cruiser kind of flew in to, to see what was going on down on the planet's surface, that when we cut inside, we have a female captain there, and she's talking to her crew. And one of the cheats that they do in animation is some of those Imperials have their hat down really low so you don't see their eyes. And when you don't yeah. see their eyes, you know, you don't know who that character is. But there was the other guy there that she interacted with, and he's got those long 70s mutton chops, right? So another... Another callback to Rogue One and their fantastic, you know, period accurate facial hair. You know, uh, Imperial Command uh, Captain Brunson's officer there on the deck had the long mutton chops as well. And when he got out of line, she slapped him a little bit. You know, I, I, I enjoyed seeing uh, that new character show up in the episode as well. Yeah, and, uh, you know, she wasn't really successful there in the end, and her Star Destroyer uh, obviously must crash down to the surface of Geonosis, but um, I would assume we'll see that character again. I'm thinking that'll be a reoccurring, you know, Imperial. I don't know for sure, but it feels like it, w it will be, so. Right. Um, there were a couple of shots. There's always in Rebels, I think the show is beautiful. I love the the art style. I love, the, I love you know, the way it looks. And there's always a couple of shots that really stand out to me. Um, when the ghost was descending, you know, down to Geonosis and the storm oh, was yeah. going on, yeah. there were some shots that just looked beautiful, right. I thought, of, of the ghost there. And then I also really like the sort of the overhead shot uh, when it was, I think it was a Star Destroyer, right, that, uh, that they had light, there. Light cruiser. Yeah, like, a light cruiser. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when that light cruiser was sort of um, pulling, I don't know how you would phrase it, pulling up over the the kind of tunnel. That shaft, you yeah. See, yeah, you could see from above and kind of see the forks of right. the mm -hmm. of the cruiser. Right. I thought that looked really compelling. It was very it was the, the composition of that was really yeah. interesting and nicely that, done. That whole that whole usage of the shaft, anywhere anytime you can play with light, you really get to have these wonderful dynamics. When you change your perspective from like that top or way down from the bottom, super fun with the dynamics. When the ghost was coming down that shaft and they were rotating a little bit and knocking down those bridges and then when the uh, light cruiser first started to come over and was on top of it, um, Hera looked up. And when she did, she looked up through the cockpit scene that you don't normally get to see. And there's those stamps on the side of it. So you can see all of the different TIE fighters that they've taken out. And then when they're blasting their way out of that um, that shaft, it was like they were leaving the space slug's mouth, you know, and they're flying through proton torpedoes and then they were out. It was, it was another really, really great episode. Um, so if we, I think that we've covered uh, just about everything. I'm, I'm, I t I've got a ton of notes just so that we can talk about anything and everything. Uh, a couple of, uh, of final thoughts. Uh, do you have anything that you'd like to, to close with, Marcus, as we, uh, as we get out here? Um, well, I think that story arc is over. Um, I think so too. Well, we, we, I'll interrupt real quick. It is over, but I did a little bit more research. Um, the Darth Vader comic book actually comes back to Geonosis. Have you read? You guys read this one? Um, I have. Uh, I have. It, it comes back to Geonosis, and there's one small part where um, the they they talk a little bit, and Vader is there to steal like this factory equipment, and there is a Geonosian queen that is there and she's like taking um and and she's hybridizing the uh the actual geonosians and the uh battle droids and making new sort of like geonosians out of these two so that queen is you know the queen that was saved by click clack okay yes 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 i remember that and i I guess I won't say anything. I was going to say, I, I think I remember the outcome of that uh, as well. But, I, you know, maybe go back and take a look at that, that right. issue if you haven't seen it, I suppose. I won't say more. But Right. Yeah. But so sorry, Marcus. I, I interrupted you there. I'm a terrible okay, person. I mean, I think <laughs> technically we have, what, we have eight episodes left. Uh, assuming it's a 20-episode season. We had 10 before. Yeah. I. I was looking a little bit today to see um, if there's an episode guide out there. And it... And I, I see like maybe four or five more. You know, I don't, okay. I don't know how many we have left. But yeah, I think that this story arc is over. We're not going to get Saw anymore. Right. So just, just what we saw from the, the trailer and from 
next week's episode, um, just, you know, 15 second, um, a scene, um, uh, I don't know whether, where they're going to put all those things that we saw in the trailer. Oh, right. Uh, right. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a massive, you know, final run that we have of the season with, with Obi-Wan and Maul and, and whatever else we saw. So it's going to be, you know, hold on to your seats. I mean, it's going oh, to be yeah. extremely, extremely good. How, how about you, John? Uh, you got some uh, some final thoughts from the episode here? Well, I mean, I, I love the fact that it came back with a two-episode arc. Um, I actually really, uh, one of the things that I came away with was I felt like they did a great job of kind of connecting all eras of Star Wars, and I felt the same way about Rogue One. But um, I, I really enjoyed the fact that, you know, there was a bit of uh, the classic trilogy in there, definitely some... You know, they were willing to make those jokes, uh, kind of referencing dialogue from the prequels. Right. And you have uh, you have Saw Gerrera from the Clone Wars and Rex from the Clone Wars, and you have battle droids from the prequels. But you've got uh, all this, you know, classic trilogy imagery as well. And Rebels has been good about, about that in general, but I feel like this is one of the episodes that was really strong and sort of making it all feel like one connected universe. Uh, um, so, so I love that. Um, and I, I think we may see more Saw at some point. Maybe it won't be episode, uh, season three. But maybe in season four, I, I'm not sure, right. you know, what the likelihood or, or the the ease of, of getting um, Forrest Whitaker back um, is. But, you know, just knowing what we know about Rogue One, um, Hera kind of says here in, in this episode, well, you know, I don't feel the best about Saw Gerrera, but we'll work with him. Right. And then by Rogue One, Mon Mothma says, you know, we're, we're, we've split from that guy. Yeah. Um, I think, you know. The potential to see that in Rebels is interesting. So I doubt it's this season, but I- I'd love to see to see more Saw Gerrera next season. That would be awesome. Um, one of the closing thoughts that I have is uh, is I was a little bit concerned for poor old Click Clack as he was uh, taking the queen egg and he went down under that rock. The audio cue as that rock closed, it sounded like they squashed the bug. You know, and I was I you know it just was really weird. You know, and I thought I, I I'd point that out, but. Uh, and, and the other thing that was a little bit odd about the ending of this episode is as they were flying through and the proton torpedoes blasted out that light cruiser, split it in half, and they lost the canisters. Yes. Um, they lost the canisters. They dropped the, those poison gas right back down onto Geonosis. <laughs> yeah. So that was... <laughs> and potentially... <laughs> yeah. Potentially right back into the tunnel with Click Clack, right? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> it's just right down right down that shaft all the way down, and, and poor Click Clack who's got it. Uh, I, I really, really uh, loved and enjoyed that we had the, the quote, not a, not Skywalker. I, I thought that was great. Uh, and again, the, uh, the sand, I hate sand. It gets everywhere. And mm-hmm. Rocket Troopers, fantastic episode. I, I, I'm always excited to, uh, to, to have Star Wars like this and back. Um, looking at the next episodes a little bit in the, in sort of like what, what's coming next. I'm going to call it right now. Uh, our next episode titled Warhead is going to be the Star Wars version of the Iron Giant. Okay. (laughs) All right. Sure. So what happens? The, the droid lands on the planet. He's got a mission. He's going to do it. He gets knocked in the head. Uh, he forgets what he's doing there and thinks, and they all think he's friendly, et cetera, et cetera. And then it all goes crazy from there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, such a Ralph McQuarrie inspired design. Oh yeah. Um, I, I saw the clip that they released on YouTube, but very interesting because it's got that classic Ralph McQuarrie. Obviously, it's you know very much based on his design. Right. But then it opens up and all these other weapons and things come out. And I. Oh I, yeah. I was a little, little conflicted on how I felt about that. I was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so your homework, but your homework be before I'm, next next week is uh, is watch the Iron Giant again. <laughs> okay. Good call. All right. So, Marcus, I think that you posted a, a picture of this uh, new Warhead droid and uh, the Ralph McQuarrie uh, on Facebook just recently. Um, mm-hmm. if, if people are interested in uh, following what you, uh, what Marcus, what you have going on, or listening to the uh, your work on the Five Hundred First Cast, where can people keep up with you and and, uh, and find out more about do what you're doing, or or maybe joining the Five Hundred First, or any of that information you can give out. Um, they can contact me through Facebook, uh, Twitter. Just uh, look for Marcus Doring, D-O-H-R-I-N-G. Uh, I'm mostly on Facebook, I have to say. I'm also on Instagram, but Facebook is probably my 
my uh, main social media um, output. Um, yeah, and they can ask me anything. Join the 501st. Have listened to the 501st cast. Um, just, just give me a ring. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us today. And John, you, um, you want to give a little sign off too as well and tell people where they can uh, get a hold of you and listen into your show? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I mainly do Twitter and uh, the Twitter handle is Blockade Run. Uh, I think Blockade Runner was too long or something. So it's Blockade Run on Twitter. Um, then we do have a blog website, uh, blockaderunnerpodcast.com. Excellent. Is there going to be a... Uh, a marathon or anything that you guys are going to be sponsoring for the blockade run or uh is that just <laughs> something no but we no but i i came up with i don't know who knows a hundred names uh for the podcast and wasn't sure what i wanted to call it finally settled on the blockade runner and then uh shortly after that i started to see them appearing all over the place again you know they were in uh i think yep. we saw the blockade runner and rebels again and right i thought you know what somebody's they're giving us a shout out here yeah they're uh, they're listening all, to but, you yeah. no it's it's all, john it's all about you <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, all right those, those those 20 people are uh, really <laughs> pulling the strings over at lucasfilm so <laughs> thank you 20 people at lucasfilm <laughs> well this has been a really great uh experiment tonight uh, uh we'll see how it all goes and i hope that it all recorded properly um like i said before i'm spencer brinkerhoff the third so we are recording live from Studios B3. And that's how you can uh, get a hold of me. I am Spencer B3 on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook as well. And like, uh, like Marcus, I probably spend most of my time on Facebook, but I do some Instagramming stuff as well. Um, I love talking Star Wars. Uh, I love having you guys with me here on the show. And uh, we'll look forward to making some more of these shows and watching some more Star Wars. So until next time, we'll all wave at the camera. And we'll say thank you and see you all. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.